people may come into your life. And um, let's say in a relationship, for instance, you fall in love, madly in love with this man or woman, and you think that when this man or woman leaves your life, you're going to die or you cannot survive without them. This is a prime example of survival, despite all odds. I could not believe he put that t-shirt on and went out there on stage. How did you learn so much about black people? August said, I learned it from my mother. This is Africa, the cradle of mankind's birth, where powerful kingdoms arose with stories of worth. A youth-filled land, the youngest population, with diamonds and cocoa from its fertile foundation, exemplary leaders, their legacy told. Nkrumah, Mandela, their spirits bold. From Johnson Sirleaf's Liberia, where freedom lies, and her first female leader, so wise. Let courage and dreams unite as one for a brighter tomorrow where greatness is spawned in this beautiful, colorful, and friendly domain. Greatness awaits, where hopes shall not wane, where tales of triumph weave a tapestry. Welcome to Today in African History. This was the day that the country of Guinea in West Africa became the first independent French-speaking state in Africa. And shortly afterward, Sekou Toure was elected its president. The year was 1958. The French withdrew and on the 2nd of October 1958, Guinea proclaimed itself a sovereign and independent republic with Sekuturi as president. The Washington Post observed the, in quote, brutal French tearing down all that they consider their contributions to Guinea. In reaction, and as a warning to other French-speaking territories, the French pulled out of Guinea over a two-month period, taking everything they could with them. They even unscrewed light bulbs, removed plans for sewage pipelines in Conakry, the capital, and even burned medications rather than leave them for the Guineans. How petty is that of the French? How very, very, very petty. The French also recalled all their professional people and civil servants and removed all transportable equipment. I mean, it's understandable if you recall your professional people and civil servants, that's understandable, but you removed all transportable equipment. Threatened by an economic breakdown, Seguturu accepted support from the communist bloc and at the same time sought help from Western nations. Very interesting. Happy Independence Day, Guinea. Um, you survived? In spite of the French pulling out, in spite of the French taking their stuff with them as much as they could, Guinea is still Guinea today. Uh, it does show that, you know, people may come into your life. And I'm just bringing this down to a personal level now. People may come into your life. And um, let's say in a relationship, for instance, you fall in love, madly in love with this man or woman, and you think that when this man or woman leaves your life, you're going to die or you cannot survive without them. This is a prime example of survival, despite all odds. So happy Independence Day to our Guinean brothers and sisters. Happy Independence Day. Next, on this day, August Wilson, nay Frederick August Kittel Jr. So a man who changes his name is N-E. So N with the apostrophe on the 
E, the accent on the E, I beg your pardon, it's an accent on the E. So, M.E. Frederick August Keitel Jr. Changed his name to August Wilson. He was born April 27, 1945. He died sadly on the 2nd of October, 2005. He was an American playwright. He has been referred to as the theater's poet of black America. He is best known for a series of 10 plays collectively called the Pittsburgh Cycle or the Century Cycle, with chronicle, which chronicle the experiences and heritage of the African-American community in the 20th century. In 2006, Wilson was inducted into the American Theatre Hall of Fame. Since Wilson's death, two of his plays have adapted, have been adapted into films, Fences in 2016 and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom in 2020. Denzel Washington has shepherded the films and has vowed to continue Wilson's legacy by adopting the rest of his plays into films for a wider audience. Washington said, the greatest part, what's left of my career, is making sure that August is taken care of. Listen to this guys, this is an absolutely fascinating interview by August Wilson's friend Nathaniel Nesmith. Right? You can see from his t-shirt, he says here, I am supposed to be white. And he does look white. But this guy has a black mother and has a white father, of course. And this interview is absolutely eye-opening. You know, for someone who most people would regard as white, it gives or it gave him an insight into the, the real thinking of racist people. Now, when another white man interacts with him, assuming he's a white man, and he thinks this white man says about black people. Absolutely fascinating. It just tells you um, how some people really are. The people who are two-faced, you know, you see some people of a different skin color, they have certain assumptions about you because of your skin color, but they don't tell you to your face. You know, some do, but most don't. Listen to this, guys. So, he says, the question was, did you ever talk to him about his white father? Or did he ever talk about his white father? The answer was, not much. I think he may have referenced it once, saying he was not much around. He was not around much. But I got the impression that the absent father was very important in August's life. Now, he always talked about his mother in glowing terms. Beautiful tribute to her, Daisy. But the father, no. I was talking to a friend of mine, he is black, and we were talking about August. And he said something that was very intriguing. The play about his father is the one he really wanted to write, but didn't. I can understand that because it would be painful. It would be a painful thing to have to do. I remember August had a one-man show that he was doing toward the end of his life. I didn't see the show itself. I saw a photograph of him wearing a t-shirt and the t-shirt said, I'm supposed to be white. I could not believe he put that t-shirt on and went out there on stage. He did. People would mistake him for being white. He told me, for example, about taxi drivers who thought he was white. And they would, all of a sudden, erupt with some racist statement about black people, not knowing he was black. Or obviously that he had a black mother. There was a white man at one of his plays during the question and answer, which, who asked him, how did you learn so much about black people? August said, I learned it from my mother. The man then gasped, he mistook August for being a white person. So I think there was something there that August did not really express in play form. If that was a play, it would be very hard to write because it would have been so intensely personal. This is absolutely fascinating. So this guy, his name again is August Wilson. This was the day that he sadly died in 2005. 
it was referred to as Theatre's Wet of Black America, best known for a series of 10 plays collectively called The Pittsburgh Cycle. Denzel Washington has sworn to continue Wilson's legacy by adapting the rest of his plays into films for a wider audience. Denzel Washington said, the greatest part of what's left of my career is making sure that August is taken care of. Absolutely fantastic, absolutely fascinating guy. So we go on to the last person for today, last but not least. Of course, this is the famous Johnny Lee Cochran Jr. Born on this day, October 2nd, 1937, he died on the 29th of March, 2005. He was an American attorney, best known for his leading role in the defense and criminal acquittal of O.J. Simpson for the murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. He often defended his client with rhymes such as, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit during the Simpson trial. Cochran represented Sean Combs, Michael Jackson, Tupac Shakur, Stanley Tukey Williams, Todd Bridges, football player Jim Brown, Snoop Dogg, former heavyweight champion Riddick Bowe, 1992 Los Angeles riot beating victim Reginald Oliver, Denny, and inmate and activist Geronimo Pratt. He represented athlete Marion Jones when she faced drug charges of doping during her high school track career. Cochran was known for his skill in the courtroom and his prominence in the early advocates for victims of police brutality. So Johnny Cochran for you, made famous by the O.J. Simpson case, he passed on this. He was born on the 2nd of October 1937, passed, sadly, March 29, 2006. Before I end the second, the second of this video, I'm going to show you a photograph of Johnny Cochran with famous or infamous, depending on how you want to look at it, O.J. Simpson. So here is Johnny Cochran with his clients, O.J. Simpson. Uh, O.J. Simpson looking red-faced here, with red eyes. Um, well. For those of you who are old enough to remember this case, uh, the police chasing um, Mr. O.J. Simpson throughout the streets of um, the city where this crime was committed many, many, many years ago. I remember watching this as a kid. And um, in my mind, you know, this guy was guilty, um, but he had a very good lawyer who could find holes in the argument of the other side. Um, I, my words fail me now to remember what term, what legal term to use. But yeah, so that is the famous or infamous O.J. Simpson in the courtroom with his lawyer, Mr. Johnny Cochran, who was born on this day, October 2nd, 1937, and died on the 29th of March, 2005. So that's it, folks, for today's Today in African History. Like I said, it's about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You make up your mind about O.J. Simpson. Was he guilty? Did he kill his ex-wife and her boyfriend? Um, if he did, why did he do that? They were not married anymore. She had somebody who you know, she was now going out with. But yeah, I'm sure um, O.J. Simpson now would be quite elderly now, probably in his 70s or 80s now. He would have his kids, the, the mother of um, the woman that died, and his kids communicating with their dad. Do the kids think their dad killed their mom? We don't know what the story is, but well, he was acquitted. That's the story, and um, that's how it, it is, and that's how I guess it would be until. So that's it. Join us tomorrow for another edition of Today in African History. So join us tomorrow, October 3rd. Thanks for dropping by. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe to the channel, turn on your notification bell. That's if you like what we're sharing here. Thanks for your support. Have a fantastic day. Hasta la vista. Bye-bye.